total solar eclipses. I have never shot one before, and if you had asked me a month ago whether or not I was interested in shooting the one that's coming up, I would have said no. But since then, I have spent endless hours researching, reading, watching videos, and learning everything there is to know about a total solar eclipse, to the point where I am now convinced that this is an opportunity you do not want to miss. So I'm gonna share everything that I've learned about how to safely and properly shoot a total solar eclipse, as well as some of the rare things that happen before, during, and after. And if you keep watching, of course, we'll talk about camera settings and how to find the perfect exposure when you're trying to shoot a total solar eclipse. The first thing, of course, is finding the right location. Now, if you're in North America, if you're in Canada, this total solar eclipse is for you. I think if you're in Dallas, Texas, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Buffalo, New York, Niagara Falls, Canada, if you're east of Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, some of those areas, I'll put a link to a map down in the description, but let me know down in the description, are you in the path of totality or are you driving somewhere? Have you found a unique composition? Are you driving from another country? Maybe we should start a competition down in the description to see who's uh, flying or driving the farthest. Now, you do want to be in the path of totality, as they call it. It kind of sounds like the end of the world, but that's what it's called. If you're just outside of it and you're thinking, oh, well, I'll just see it wherever I am, you won't. There, There is some things you can see, but if you want to experience the full thing, if you want to shoot photos of it, definitely put yourself into the path of <laughs> Totality. The path of totality. Sounds like you're gonna get run over by a truck or something. You might be tempted to find a different location that has like a better composition or like an epic mountain range. Don't worry about any of that. All the photographers that I've talked to who shoot astro, who shoot events like this say, just focus on getting the sun. Just focus on getting that total solar eclipse. But we need to do it safely, which is why you saw me wearing these goofy looking glasses at the beginning. These are ISO certified solar glasses. I picked them up on Amazon. I'll link these ones down in the description. You can get them in like a pair or like you can buy 10 of them for you and all of your friends. Regular sunglasses do not work. They are not safe and they are not dark enough. Now you might think, well, I look at the sun on a regular basis. Is it magically stronger during a solar eclipse? The answer is no, but staring at the sun for long periods of time is bad and simply staring at it with sunglasses, you won't be able to see the sun do its little thing. You need to wear these before the total solar eclipse. You can take them off during totality. That is the only time you can take them off. And then right after, you do need to put them back on. I don't know, this could be a new look. I can't see anything through these. I don't even know if I'm looking at the camera. No light is coming through at all. In addition to your eyes, you also need to keep your camera safe. Now, if you're shooting on a DSLR, a DSLR has an optical viewfinder. So if you have any camera with an optical viewfinder, if you're gonna look through the viewfinder, you need to look through the viewfinder with these glasses. Or if you have a mirrorless camera or a DSLR camera, you need one of these. Now you might think this looks like a regular ND filter, but it is not. It is a super dark 16 and a half stop ND filter, fixed ND filter. You can use one of these. A lot of people also recommend using a full on solar filter, which has built in UV and infrared protection. There's a debate whether or not you need it. Some people say you need it for film. Some people say you don't. If you want to be super safe, then get a full on solar filter. This is the one that I'll be using, but use whatever you use at your own risk. But a 16 and a half stop or a 20 stop ND filter will be enough. If you remember back when we were kids, we used to have these lovely things. And maybe your grandparents or your parents or someone gave you one of these when you were a kid and in the summer, you got a piece of paper or you got like leaves and you, and you, and you used a magnifying glass to like magnify the sun and like burn the leaves and burn the insects and burn. Listen, I didn't burn the insects. Maybe you did. I didn't. I, I burned the paper, just the paper, the newspaper. <laughs> but the same effect where you can use this to burn a piece of paper is the same effect that when you take your camera lens, well, your camera lens is, a, is essentially a magnifying glass or like a, a telescope where it refines the sun, it focuses the sun at the focal plane of your camera sensor. And if you do not have an ND filter, a strong enough ND filter or a solar filter, you will burn the sensor on your camera. Do not use a five stop variable ND filter. Do not use anything less than a 16 and a half stop ND filter. Again, 
Do what you want at your own risk. I have warned you, those are the facts. Before the actual totality event. <laughs> totality. There are some unique photo opportunities. One being, of course, shooting the phases of the eclipse. At the point of first contact, which is when the moon first passes in front of the sun, you will start to get that crescent shape where it looks like the moon is taking a bite out of the sun. A lot of photographers will be shooting either intervals or time-lapse sequences to capture all of those phases. Now, if you have something like a star tracker, you can actually set your camera up to follow the sun. In my case, I don't have a star tracker, so I'll be manually panning and shifting my camera around to follow the sun. But if you have an extra camera or you have a moment in between shooting those intervals, if you actually look at the shadows on the ground, they will look different than normal. So normally if you have light filtering through a tree, you will get normal circular shaped shadows. But as the moon starts to pass in front of the sun and you get those crescent shapes, the shadows will actually turn to little moon shapes on the ground. Now, the best way to see this is if you have a, a cheese grater. I watched a video and they explained it and they showed it. I'll, I'll link that video up here. But what about the camera gear? Okay, so we've talked about the ND filters, the solar filters. You may have noticed I'm using a different lens. This lens was loaned to me from Canon. Thank you, Canon, for loaning this out. It is a 100 to 500 millimeter lens. Now, I'll talk about the exact focal length I think you should be using in just a bit. And then of course we need a way to actually mount our camera. Now in the past I've used travel tripods, but I actually own multiple tripods. And one of my favorite ones is this Manfrotto one. It's a little bit more expensive than your typical everyday travel tripod, but that's also because it's way more sturdy. It's an aluminum tripod, so not carbon fiber, not super expensive, but it only has three leg segments. So the fewer segments, the more sturdy it's gonna be. If you have a tripod head that has individual controls for the pan and the tilt so that you can adjust them individually, that would be a little bit better than the one that I have, which is simply just a, a ball head. Again, I'll link all these down in the description, but I was shooting with this to do, to do some test shots earlier today, and I found it a little bit finicky to have to undo the ball head to make like micro adjustments. So if you are buying a tripod head just for this, buy one that has individual controls for each of those axes. Axis? Axis? Axes? For each of the axes. You also don't need a full frame camera. If you have an APS-C camera, a crop sensor camera, it actually may be more beneficial because it will turn something like a 135 millimeter lens into a 200 lens or a 200 millimeter lens into a 300 millimeter lens. So in that case, you'll get a little bit more zoom than you would on a full frame camera. But then again, full frame cameras also do tend to have more resolution. So there's that trade off. And another thing is having a way to remotely trigger your camera. So whether you have a, a trigger, I've actually got one coming tomorrow and hasn't arrived yet, or you have uh, an app like the Canon Connect app where you can hit the camera on the app so that you're not creating any vibrations inside your camera. Again, when you're zoomed into like 300 millimeters or 500 millimeters, even just tapping the screen will shake the camera and affect the IBIS that's working both in the camera and in the lens. So having a remote shutter, almost a necessity. You can get away with it if you use the time shutter, but just know you will need to do that in order to reduce vibrations. But what about focal length? This is the one question that I actually didn't know and I had to do a ton of research. A lot of photographers recommend 300 and above, so 400 millimeters, 500 millimeters. It really depends on how much you wanna capture. I would say the minimum, if you're shooting full frame, is 200 millimeters. Any smaller and you can see that it's just gonna look way too small into frame. So if I zoom into something like 500 millimeters, you can see how much more of a photo that I'm getting. If you have the luxury to get a super telephoto 800 millimeter lens or a 1000 millimeter plus lens, then obviously you're gonna be able to get more detail, but it really depends on the composition and what you wanna capture. There are two different sets of camera settings at least that you're gonna wanna know before going out and shooting the total solar eclipse. So before the total solar eclipse happens, meaning today or tomorrow, you can actually go out and test your camera settings. So today I went out with 500 millimeters at an aperture of F8. 
an ISO, so I'm choosing the lowest base native ISO possible. In my case, that's 100, or I could also set it to 200, kind of in that low, low range, so I'm not getting a ton of noise. So F8, ISO 200, I found that a shutter speed between one over 800 and one over 1000 gave me a perfect exposure of the sun. But you'll have to test that for whatever area that you live in. So if you're in an area where the total solar eclipse happens closer to the beginning of the day at sunrise or at the end of the day at sunset, you may actually have to increase your shutter time to let more light into your camera. But in the last few phases where we have that crescent moon, as we have that last sliver of light, the light is gonna decrease and you're gonna to want to increase your shutter time by either a third of a stop or about half of a stop to compensate for the less amount of light. And then as soon as totality hits, as soon as we have second contact and the moon is fully on top of the sun, that is when you're gonna to wanna to take your ND filter off. My ND filter's over here. My ND filter off. And at that point, you need to be acting fast, but you don't actually have to change your camera settings because the camera settings that you used with the ND filter during full sunlight should be roughly the same as the camera settings that you're gonna use during totality. So the corona, which again is that area of the sun that's kind of like doing all the crazy stuff and has the glowy effects, the variance in brightness from the lower inner corona to the outer corona is absolutely massive. So another thing you're gonna to wanna to do is exposure bracket. Now I would recommend doing at least three photos. Some people are saying five photos, seven photos, nine photos. The more you can do, the more flexibility you'll have later when editing or compositing or putting all of these photos together. Now what you don't wanna do is if you you don't have a star tracker and you're not tracking with the sun, you should aim to keep your shutter time below one second. I went out today and I did a little video of the sun, like a 30 second video. And from the beginning to the end, at 500 millimeters, you can see that the sun actually moves quite a bit, which means if you're doing a two second or a four second or a five second exposure, you're actually gonna have blurring and the subject of the sun won't be nice and sharp and in focus. There are a few different effects that you can get while you're shooting during totality. So the first is what they call like the beading, the Bailey's beads that you get around the perimeter, which are basically all these little glowing effects. Now, if you, underexpose, you are more likely to get all of those beading effects. But if you up your exposure, meaning you extend your shutter time, so instead of doing one over a thousand, now you drop it to one over 500 or one over 250, now you're gonna capture more of that outer corona, but then the inner corona will be overexposed. And if you wanna get that diamond ring effect where the outer edge is glowing and you have like one spot that kind of looks like a, a diamond ring, the tip that I've received is to do one to two stops less than what you would have shot during the full disc phase of shooting the sun. So the settings that you got the day before when you practice to get the right exposure, instead of doing you know, the settings I recommend at one over a thousand, you would drop that to one over 250. But how? did I know to pick those numbers? How did I know to pick those camera settings? Well, there's a really awesome guide from Mr. Eclipse. His name is Fred, I believe. I'll, I'll put the chart on screen now and we can go through it together. First thing you're gonna to wanna to do is pick your ISO. So I'd recommend 100 or 200. In this case, let's do 100 and then we go over to our aperture number. So our f-stop, that will depend on the lens, but also I'd recommend like if you have a lens that's f seven going a little bit higher to get a little bit of a, of a sharper image. So in this case, let's go 100 and F8, and then we go down and the shutter speeds are what we're exposing for. So if we want to expose for the inner Corona, it's going to be like one over 250th of a second. If we want to get like a full massive halo Corona, like a big wavy effect, then we're going to need a longer shutter time. You can see that there's a pretty wide range of shutter speeds, which is why if you're not sure, I'd recommend picking something in the middle, go out, test it during the day to make sure you know at least what your pre totality settings are. And then for your totality settings, look at this chart, have that number in mind, but then be ready to do exposure bracketing. So in my case, I go in and I grab the little exposure compensation bracketing. I grab this setting right here and I click on it and I click on it and I roll the wheel. And now you can see I'm taking a, a middle exposure 
and then a plus and a minus exposure. So my recommendation is figure out your camera settings before, because as soon as we hit that second point of contact and we are now in the phase of totality, you have anywhere from one minute to four minutes to actually shoot this thing. But as soon as it ends, the after process is much like the before process, but you're just doing everything in reverse. So at that point, if you wanna keep shooting, you have to put your ND filter, your solar filter back on and your glasses to protect your eyes. But that is pretty much everything you need to know. If you're looking for these or for lenses or for filters or, or for everything, I'll link all of that along with the chart. That is probably the single most valuable resource that you can reference down in the description. There'll be more reading, more things, more whatever for you to check out. Make sure you get out and actually test your camera settings and let me know where will you be during the total solar eclipse. Let's uh, let's smash this thing together and get some awesome photos. And until then, get out, grab your camera, and go shoot photos.